Hey, Benjamin Gottlieb here. We've got another episode for you in our limited series we're calling Learn with Shopify in just a minute. But before that, I have a request. Head over to shopify.com slash survey and tell us what you think about our show. And if you do, you'll be entered to win some sweet Shopify merch and gift cards. Again, that's shopify.com slash survey. All right, enough of that. Enjoy the episode. You have to want to win and have to want to grow. And we do, you know, and if you feel like you actually want to win, you actually want to grow. Well, what does winning look like? Welcome to Learn with Shopify. I'm Adam LeVinter. I'm the founder and CEO of Scriberbase, where we help companies launch and scale their subscription businesses. So when you think of wool, what comes to mind? Maybe hot, itchy, it gets wet when it rains, right? Well, we're not talking about your grandpa's wool sweater. Dan Dembski and his friends were traveling across North America years ago following their favorite bands when they came across merino wool. And it's certainly different from the traditional stuff. Soft, breathable, and no, it doesn't itch. With help from Shopify, Dan has turned his brand Unbound Merino into a multi-million dollar business. They sell t-shirts, hoodies, beanies, all with Merino wool as their main component. Dan, I'm so glad to have you here on the show. Well, I'm thrilled to be here. And thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. So um, let's rewind back uh, a couple of years now. So you guys were growing 100% year over year since you launched. That said, when COVID hits, I assume sales take a hit. So take us back to March 2020. What did that first few months look like? Probably like many, many people out there, it was horrifying you know, especially for us uh, or anyone that was in any kind of travel business, you know, we are an apparel brand, but the positioning that we've really carved out for ourselves was in the travel niche. The entire business was built on the premise that you could pack less and experience more. That was our tagline. That's the, the brand promise, the brand story, so to speak. So one thing we couldn't have anticipated, and it felt like a, a more than a slap in the face was a global travel ban. It was it was horrible news. And immediately, you know, we were used to these gangbusters growth of sales. Like everything was going really well. And those were early days for us, but it just completely stopped. And uh, everything that we worked so hard to refine in the travel niche, you know, I'm talking years of iterating our ads, iterating our messaging. Uh, it was, it felt like it was all for nothing suddenly. So, uh, we had to do a lot of digging, a lot of soul searching, and a lot of trying to figure out who are we in this new world. So you have all these ads running at the time. They're all focused on travel. Um, you have to go back, I assume, into this war room, figure out your new positioning. What was that new positioning? I think a big part of us was thinking, can we weather the storm and get to the point where travel opens back up? Because that's who we are. That's what we built this thing around. And we tried a few things. You know, we tried doing you know, things more around, like messaging more around comfort, more around work from home, which is obviously a huge thing. Um, and there were some little pockets that we found within that that worked. But the real shift that we we, we changed to is let's take, a, let's take a pause. Let's try to slow down on the new customer acquisition, which was everything we were focused on at the time, especially with, you know, Facebook advertising and all that. And let's focus on the customers we already have built. You know, we amassed a pretty big email list at that point. Uh, what could we do to communicate with our existing customers, you know, by our, with our email channels, um, with releasing new products and focus on that and with the intention of just working with what we already have and just getting through this thing. Mm -hmm. Do you remember what those first few iterations of those emails were like? What was the tone? How are you marketing? How are you speaking to your customers? You know, we, we were very, very reluctant to send too many emails before the pandemic. And one thing we learned in the pandemic is that, you know, we could send a lot more. We thought if we send too many emails, everyone's going to unsubscribe and we're going to lose our email list. And we were very paranoid about releasing too many emails, too much marketing. But we thought if we could release new products maybe that's a good reason to reach out to our customer base. If we have a pretty big customer base, but I mean, we can't just keep sending an email about the same black t-shirt. What could we do? And one thing we did, which was actually worked out really well for us, you know, you got to think about right at the beginning of the pandemic, right at the beginning of the lockdowns, how many businesses were completely shook up. And that includes our own suppliers, right? 
So we called our our main suppliers and suppliers that you know we only sometimes work with, and we said, "Do you have any material that we could buy? What do you have?" Some of it might have been in the same sort of fabric weight and similar composition as our T-shirts. Some of it might have been something that we haven't created, like a more of a mid-layer type fabric. But what we went, we went to them and said, "Could we buy X amount of this fabric, and then we'll create new products out of it?" So be it a mid-layer, layer, be it a new color of T-shirt. For our suppliers, this was a blessing because they had nothing they could do with this material anyway. They were supposed to sell it and they can't. So now we're coming along and we're buying up material that's just sitting in their factories. And for our customer, we now have all these great new things to talk about. You know, we have a limited edition color. It was only X amount of pieces. This will sell out within two days. And it would be like a little event. So the interesting thing about where we were at was we were in the travel niche, which is probably the one of the worst industries to be in when there's a global travel ban, right? Like it, it was horrible. But what worked out well for us was we're an e- entirely e-commerce business, entirely direct to consumer. So e-commerce as a whole was just booming in the pandemic because no one can go out to stores. So that one piece of who we were was like a lifeline for us. So I said, let's mm-hmm. just, people are still going to need to buy clothes. They, they're going to start to work from home. They're going to, maybe we can position like that. So let's just create reasons to talk to our customer base. So that became new product releases and that became the main focus of what was our strategy for getting us through the pandemic. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, you're taking a risk, right? Because you are buying a product uh, from these suppliers, as you've just described, uh, assuming that your your list is is going to buy on the other side, right? So you're taking this upfront sort of expense risk, if you will, not quite knowing how consumers would behave. Yeah, I mean, everything's a risk in business, but I, I, I that didn't feel like a risk at the time because – we we knew the brand love we had. You know, we see the customers coming back for more. And at, at the core of our business, we have our customers that come back. That's why I think we're doing well. It's not because, you know, the, the new customer acquisition is great, but the real way we make money, the real value to investing in new customer acquisition is customers that come back. And we knew our customers come back. So, you know, we had a we have a we had a pretty good grasp on how much product could we sell, you know, in the first few weeks after an email campaign? And because this was fabric that was readily available to us, we didn't have to buy like huge minimum order quantities. We could buy like, I mean, uh, the first one that we did, we bought enough to make a hundred t-shirts and that's a very small amount for us. We were able to sell that out in an hour, right? So we're like, Mm. well, that was great. We just put it up. We took, we didn't do a custom photo shoot for it. We just did a flat lay photo, very simple stuff. So we're like, well, that was good. Why don't we just do more of that? That was very, very cheap for us to do. And there was almost no risk. So it was about finding the right amount that we could sort of just bring into stock and get out of stock right away. I'm talking with Dan Dembski, co-founder of Unbound Merino. Dan, um, we're, we're talking about this commitment to product and uh, your expansion, bringing these limited runs uh, of new stuff to your customer base. At the same time, you know, folks are now obviously aware of all of the supply chain challenges related to product coming from overseas. And your suppliers, if I'm correct, are in China. So at the same time, I would assume you are wrestling with longer lead times, perhaps a higher cost of goods. Can you speak to how you navigated through that? Yeah, I mean, it's not easy. It was not, we, 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 we suffered in the same way as anyone else. And, you know, at some points we had to airship like huge quantities of stuff in, which was very expensive to us to do. But uh, we also manufacture here locally. So we have a lot of Toronto manufacturers, which has been really good for us. So uh, for larger order quantities, we had stuff coming in from China, but we have a lot of material that sits here in Toronto for doing smaller smaller runs of stuff. So if we need to make a couple hundred extra t-shirts or a couple extra hundred extra hoodies, we have reserves of fabric. The supply chain issues have been going on for so long that it's just, you know, you just learn to deal with them. We, we would see three months to get products done, became four months, became five months, became five and a half months. And over time, it's just projecting how much you think you could sell and just dealing with it. But I must say that's the hardest part of running a business is managing the inventory, getting the right stuff in, making sure you have enough resources to make sure that you're preparing for any growth that might come within 
four, five, six, seven months ahead. That's the constant challenge where I feel like if I could talk to you today about what we did, but if we talked in six months and talked in 12 months, I'll be so much more sophisticated than I was today as I am so much more sophisticated today as I was six months ago, because that's the hardest part and the constant challenge of running this business. I'm sure there are a lot of folks listening that are wrestling with those challenges right now, uh, trying to forecast how to bring inventory over, how much to commit to, uh, forecasting quantities, things like that. Um, what are some tactical tips or uh, successes, best practices that you can share? I'll talk about something that relates to us and it doesn't relate to every business. You know, because we're a premium not, I wouldn't, we're not a luxury product, but more a premium product. And the, you know, the price point reflects as such, we can afford to airship things in. And that's really helped us. You know, if you have thinner margins and you need to boat ship things in and there's like, you know, there's, there's gridlock at the shipping ports for bringing stuff in by boat. That's a challenge that's much bigger. So the reality is, and this is not a great answer, uh, you know, for, I guess the typical listener of any e-commerce podcast, but we dealt with it by air shipping most of our stuff. And that was just the, the, the necessary evil of what we had to do to make sure that we were well stocked and we didn't stock out and couldn't sell stuff. The boat shipping is next to zero throughout the entire pandemic. Cause you know, we're still selling stuff and we still have to bring it in. So in our case, we could afford to do that. Um, if we had to boat ship everything, it might've been a lot bigger of a nightmare. It sounds like you guys were really able to navigate uh, at least the early days of the pandemic and beyond and reposition yourselves kind of away from travel in a way. What advice can you share with other businesses that are in the travel space, have product that they're selling that's related to travel that might be interested in your own experience? There is a pent up energy of people who are dying to travel. They're dying to have a vacation. A lot of people have a regular budget they have for vacation that has not been spent. I think it's exciting to be in the travel business right now, as long as you weathered the storm. So I think it, I think it's about to boom, to be perfectly honest. Um, mm -hmm. But if in, in terms of getting through the pandemic or being in a position where they're, you know, being in the travel niche has been tough or continues to be tough. What's really worked for us is just the fact that we are so product focused. We're focused on the quality of our own product that, you know, once people have come to know our product and trust our product, they love it. Like there's a lot of people, there's a guy I know in the city. I met him through a friend and I was talking about our clothing. He said he wanted to buy a shirt. And I, I said, you know what? Let me give you one because I had one in my car. So I gave him a shirt a year and a half, couple of years later. I, I saw his an order come in from him when I was looking in our Shopify backend and I clicked into his name and I saw he's ordered 12 times. I almost feel like I'm like a, like a drug dealer, you know, you get them hooked, you give them like a little sample and then they're hooked for life, you know? So if you invest in having a really good product, it becomes easier to sustain a growing business because yes, it's still expensive to acquire new customers and marketing could be really, really costly. And, but if they're coming back, you just don't have to work as hard. So that's been central to our growth. It's it's just being obsessed about never, ever cutting corners and always making sure the quality is good. And I think that that's not just for a travel product. That's for any kind of product. If you can build trust with your customers by just having something good that people like, that they tell their friends about, that they'll come back for, that's a winning business strategy. And it's super simple. You mentioned that it's expensive to acquire customers. Um, I think a lot of founders listening are going to perk up at that because they feel like Facebook marketing is almost a necessary evil and they've got to have social media ads running on Facebook or Instagram in order to drive sales. And at the same time, you sort of figured out during the pandemic that that wasn't necessarily the case for you guys. Is that right? So when we started advertising on Facebook, that was right when we started our business, you know, the big, big, like I'd say really, really getting the Facebook ads in 2017, that was on the tail end of what felt like a gold rush. You know, there's never been an advertising platform like that in the history of advertising. It was unbelievable. And we grew so fast. I mean, for every dollar that we'd put into advertising, we'd make close to six or more, you know? So, so we scaled really fast. And the only problem we had in business at that point was we just 
didn't have enough inventory because we were growing way too fast. So as much of a problem you could have for in your business, that's the best one to have. It's like you just keep selling out. And that lasted for a long time, but the return slowly, slowly started to diminish to the point now where it's like, yeah, you're right. It feels kind of like a necessary evil. Like you don't want to pull the plug, but it's not what it used to be. And I think that as we've gone fully digital, the when – you know, maybe the the pandemic e-commerce boom has made it even worse. You know, there's so many factors that make it worse. These iOS updates come in. It's hard to find a little pocket where you could have those kind of returns with online advertising. I hear now it's TikTok, you know, but that's a whole other thing to learn. I find the the whole world of advertising right now for online advertising, it's gotten way, way tougher and the truly, truly gifted marketers are the ones that can sort of find these alternative ways to market without having to rely on heavy, heavy ad spend. And that's a hard thing to do. And it takes, you know, I don't think we're there yet. I mean, we have, we rely on our product and we rely on the customer list that we've built, but there's ways to do it, but it's just becoming a tougher and tougher landscape to do it on online advertising. Let's dive a little bit deeper um, into this for one sec. So I'll put you on the spot. As you're thinking about marketing strategy going forward, how are you and your team thinking about diversifying marketing dollars away from Facebook and into some of these other new platforms that you're talking about? For example, if you have $100 to spend on customer acquisition, let's just use round numbers um, for this example. How do you think about deploying those dollars? So, so you can buy customers through a various different advertising channels, right? And it's going to be, you know, expensive, or maybe you can get find a good place to market. If you find your right niche, people say TikTok's good. People say Pinterest could be good. I really think, you know, if, if you have the money to spend, and there are a lot of brands that do this, you can just pump money into new customer acquisition. As long as you know what the lifetime value of your customer is, it's worth investing. If you know long-term how that's going to, how that's going to impact your business. But what I'm really trying to get into now, and you know, there is no secret sauce for this. It's just sheer marketing ingenuity. Is how can you do it for nothing? You know, like I'll tell you, like for us, one bag travel is a huge thing. There's a community of people who they're obsessed with this concept of one bagging, one bag travel. Mm -hmm. There's a Reddit community, Reddit slash r slash one bag and slash one bag travel. Right, so. For us, we've, we've done this before and we could do it again. Who are the people who are big players on that subreddit? Because these are tastemakers for a niche that really applies to us, right? So they could go and they can they have a million ways to try to figure out how can they pack light. So for those are our influencers. Those are the people. Not I don't mean influencers in the sense of like Instagram influencers that like, you know, they take pictures with like some like fitness product and like it does nothing for your business and it's like cheesy, like cliche influencers. I mean- they're influencers in the sense that in a niche that we want to play in, they have real influence. So that's not that's the kind of marketing that doesn't cost you much other than giving a free sample, you know, building relationships. So for us, we're trying to drill into a lot more of that, find the real tastemakers who are, are actually influential in, in the communities in which we want to reside. And focus on building relationships there. So the strategy for us going forward is going to be a lot less about spending lots of money to acquire customers, more about spending energy to be creative and put our flag in the places where we want to put our flag. Put a pin in something that I want to come back to. Uh, You mentioned the emphasis on product quality. And I'm curious, you know, as you shopped around or shop around for the right product manufacturers. How would you suggest that other businesses go about finding the right manufacturer to become their supplier of their product? You kind of know when you find the right people, but you just have to know everything that's important to you. So the process for us, I mean, we found our, originally found our suppliers in Alibaba. I went through Alibaba and I searched for everyone that appeared to be able to make merino wool anything. And I just opened tab after tab after tab after tab of different suppliers. I had hundreds of tabs. I was looking for people who 
were specialized in merino wool manufacturing. And then, you know, can can we meet their minimum order quantities? You know, then do they look reliable? Then we start to message them. Of course, if you're dealing with people overseas, language barrier could be an issue. So are you able to communicate easily with them? Are they interested in doing business with you? Do they respond to you quickly enough? It's kind of like dating, right? Like you ha- have to feel like, yeah, we're getting somewhere here. You know, they're talking, they can do, these order quantities seem like they might work for us. And slowly, slowly narrowed it down until we had a couple dozen, you know? And then from those, we asked about ordering samples and we 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 sort of specced out what our product would be like. I think we ended up ordering samples from five or six. And of those five or six, two of them immediately were like, no, these are these, these are bad. We ended up with three suppliers that we really liked and then two that we just had the best relationship with. We still work with those two today. It was like, it was like a, we knew what we wanted. We had a ton of clarity about it and the communication was good. The language barrier wasn't an issue. They were gung-ho about working with us. We were gung-ho about working with them. And it was sort of just this process of elimination until you had these people. And the relationship matters so much because these are I don't think there's a more important relationship when you're in our kind of line of work than the people who are making your product because we're in it, like we said, we're a product business, right? We're so close with our suppliers that we were invited to their family weddings and went. Hmm. So like I went, you know, it was up in rural China. We went to this like epic wedding um, and they loved having, like we're really close with them. We talk with them all the time. We could be very candid. Um, we can have hard conversations, you know, when we were scaling and we couldn't afford our own growth, like we were telling them about that. And they extended a line of credit to us so that they could help us because they understood that we're growing. You know, we have a relationship with our suppliers that's really deep. If it's, I think if there's anything to take away from my story that is important is, is try to get there. You know, it's not just a transactional relationship. It's a really meaningful and a really important one. You mean travel overseas to actually physically meet them in person and oh, be there on site? Oh, yeah, we from the get-go. I mean... The first, this was the first time I ever man, manufactured overseas, so I was paranoid about getting ripped off. You know, you hear horror stories about, you know, children working in factories, which in our case is completely untrue. We needed to be able to know that where we were manufacturing, it was it was ethical. We could go to sleep at night, but we also were protecting ourselves from getting ripped off because I've heard stories of people, you know, starting to have a, a growing business and what they end up getting is – completely lower quality, you know, different, the wrong sizes. They use a cheaper glue to make a shoe or crazy stuff where it, it could implode your business. So our top concern was product quality. And we went in there to physically have presence during our initial runs. The first many, we budgeted that into our business. We're going to go and we'll show up. So it was partially to protect ourselves from getting ripped off. But the other piece was Let's become friends with them because they're going to be important. And if we're going to grow this thing, they're going to be an important relationship for many, many years. My guest today is Dan Dembski, co-founder of Unbound Merino. It's a clothing company that makes beanies, hoodies, t-shirts, meant for travel, all from Merino wool. Dan, uh, you have a track record as a serial founder. I'd call you an exceptional zero to one guy, but it's a very different thing to become a productive CEO which you're now navigating. Can you talk about the skill sets of a founder versus a CEO and what you've learned during your transition? It's kind of a learn the hard way every day sort of situation. And you nailed it. Like I, you know, I I can confidently say I have founder blood. It's been in me from the day I was born. I've always sort of felt like entrepreneurial and I've started a few businesses. I've, this is the third business that I've started to take to over seven figures. And I kind of haven't really gone past that until Unbound Merino. Unbound Merino has grown past my other businesses and my other ventures. And as we grow, I slowly am starting to feel that all of the things that made me great as a founder are slowly becoming more and more irrelevant to the point in which they don't matter at all. You know, the only thing that matters about me in this business right now is I'm kind of at the core of this business, like truly authentically like the core customer. I made this product almost for myself, you know? So I live and breathe what this brand is from an ethos standpoint. But the skills of running a growing business are different than the skills of of starting a business. 
And it's it's related to leadership. It's related to managing like a, a heavier operation. And these are things I'll be perfectly candid with you. I'm terrible at, and I don't want to be terrible at. I'm in a position now where if all of the skills I had to get us here are not the skills that are needed to get us to where we need to go. And I'm either going to have to requalify for this job at leading, you know, becoming a CEO. I have to quali- learn what a CEO even is. Like I've been asking my CEO friends, like, what is a CEO anyway? Like it's, I didn't even know, like, what am I supposed to do every day? And I'm figuring that out and I'm really, really trying to learn, but all the things I need to do to get us to where we need to go. And if it's not going to be me, I better get out of the way because someone else is going to have to do it, but I want it to be me. So, you know, as hard as it is to make that transition, what's interesting is all of the shortcomings that I have that are holding me back from taking us to that next, you know, stage of growth, wherever we want to go, the shortcomings all start to blow up in your face. You know, you're going over budget on a million things. People aren't, don't have clarity on what they're supposed to be doing. You know, if there's anything I know the CEO is supposed to do is be the helm of the vision of the company. So the vision needs to be instilled in everyone and we all need to know what we're supposed to be doing. So that's on me. And if people kind of feel like they're spinning the wheels, that's, that's on me. So leadership skills, budgeting skills, operational skills, all this stuff is blowing up in my face to be perfectly candid and I kind of, I mean, as hard as it could be, I kind of love it because it's, you know, I think experience is the best teacher. So all the mistakes I'm making are, 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 that's my teacher. But how do you, and I guess your partners who I want to talk about in a second, but how do you and your partners hold you to account? Because in your case, you're not a venture backed business, right? So you don't have that pressure coming from your VCs saying, Dan, you need to do this, this, and this. Um, as a CEO. In fact, you have none of that. And you've not raised $1 from VCs to date, which we will talk about. Um, Who is holding your feet to the fire and telling you, Dan, you're doing a good job, you're not doing a good job? Well, for starters, myself, you know, and that sounds like a cheap answer, but it's true. Look, we have a, a small leadership team, but we all care. You know, my, my two business partners are my lifelong best friends. And, you know, people say business and friendship don't mix. I would argue that that's a whole other topic, but I think business and friendship mix beautifully. And the main reason for that is um, the level of candor that we can have between each other. Like if think of who the, your, your closest friends are, just how like, you don't have to sugarcoat anything. There's no politics. You don't, you know, you, you don't want to be mean. You don't want to be insulting, but you could just lay it on them however you feel and whether you're right or wrong, you can be like candid. So, so how we hold each other accountable is complete and utter candor, but we have very, very tight practices for, for coming up with where we want to go. Like, where do we want to go at the end of this year? Where do we want to, so in order to get there, where do we need to be at the end of this quarter? Where do we need to be in five years? And we revisit that every quarter and we just try to bring clarity around where we want to go. And then we ask ourselves, what do we need to do to get there? Well, you know, what's our, what's our, how are we going to build a team to get, you know, right now TikTok's a thing to create the advertising for TikTok. We need to learn it and we need to execute on it and we need to like try to make it work. So we know the activities that we want to do and we just make sure that we keep our eye on it and we meet once a week and talk about what's the progress on that. The thing is, is you, you have to want to win and have to want to grow and we do. You know, and if you feel like you actually want to win, you actually want to grow, well, what does, it's simple in a sense, it's what does winning look like? And I think that's where we're pretty good. We're good at defining the strategy by clearly articulating what success looks like long-term, mid-term, and short-term, and meeting up to make sure that we're holding each other accountable to it because we want to. Given that we've been challenge with this pandemic the past couple of years, retailers who effectively are your competitors are also challenged. And they've moved investment dollars into e-commerce, obviously. Given some of these shifts in investment away from, say, brick and mortar and into e-commerce or direct to consumer, what does winning look like in your next chapter? And how do you compete with these big retailers or brands that are investing or over-investing in e-commerce? You know, it's always been a fear of ours is that the barrier to entry into what we do is not that high. 
right? Like we, you, if you wanted to start a competing business tomorrow, you could, you know, there's a lot of things that you'd have to figure out and, you know, we're, we may have some time on you, but you can go do it. Right. So the, you know, we are trying to figure out what's our moat, you know, what's the mode of safety we have, uh, to protect us from intruders or into the marketplace. Um, because I'll tell you, there's brands out there that could do what we do and they could outspend us because they could be venture backed or they could be a larger company to begin with. Um, the one thing we have is our customer list and a consumer, when they find a brand they like, if they continue to deliver quality, it's hard to get them to go elsewhere. You know, you can make a something that's a bit cheaper, but they might not even care to try. So, uh, yeah, that's one thing. And then it's really on product development, trying to come up with something that's interesting and unique to our world. You know, we live and breathe in a pretty narrow box, which is carry on travel. That's sort of the world we want to continue to live and exist in. So when we think about products, we just try to think like, what can we make that's a little bit more novel than just a merino wool t-shirt, which we think we make the best one, but that's our belief and, you know, some of our customers' belief. We're really trying to focus on products we can make that are novel, unique to us. And that's, I think, the next iteration for us. It's like, what's the unique product that other people don't have? I'm speaking with Dan Dembski of Unbound Merino. Dan, you guys have raised over a million dollars from crowdfunding campaigns. You've done this three times over now. I'm sure the campaign two and three looked and felt a lot different than campaign one. But given the success in this space, what are some of the best practices, tips, tricks that you could share with other folks looking to leverage crowdfunding to raise capital for their business? I'll focus on the first campaign because that's the one we started where we had zero customers. Um, you know, I, I think first and foremost, the reason we started this business is because I felt it wasn't just like, I'm like, I want to get into the, a business and let's try clothing. It's popular. The, the real driving force behind why I think this worked to begin with is because I personally was frustrated with what else was out there. I discovered Merino wool through my travels and I fell in love with the fabric because it performed as promised. But what I didn't like is the way that all of the brands that made Merino wool clothing, the way the clothing itself looked. It was perfect for their consumers, but it wasn't perfect for me. They made stuff that was more about it was more active wear. It was more for the outdoors, the kind of stuff you'd get in, you know, maybe go on a canoe trip or camping, that kind of stuff, right? I wanted something that you could wear on a hike, but also dress up a little bit, maybe put a jacket over it, a nice watch, and you can go out for a cocktail at night. I wanted that versatility, and I was painfully disappointed with what was on the market. So I felt like we were creating something in a new, with a slightly new positioning for someone like me. So I think having a product that you're sort of solving a problem that maybe isn't being solved by other brands, that's the, the starting point. But as far as the crowdfunding mechanics go, the biggest thing we did was manufacture the momentum from the beginning of the campaign. So with the first campaign in Canadian dollars went off to do like $400,000, but we were just trying to raise $30,000 in pre-sales. But the first half of that, like that, you know, we, we knew we wanted to get past $30,000, but the first fifteen dollars to $20,000 of sales, we already knew where it was coming from and it was relying heavily on family and friends. And we did this huge campaign where I messaged every single person I knew who I was slightly comfortable asking. I'm like, listen, I'm trying to start this business. Can you, when, it, when I launch it, can you buy a t-shirt? I hate asking. It's not cheap. You know, it's not a cheap t-shirt, but you're going to be helping me like start my dream business. And I really need your support. I need as much support as I can. And they all, you know, all the people that agreed, I put their name on a list. And then when the time came, I went and I did an individual video for each one of them. So if I was doing one for you, the video would just be turn the webcam on and be like, Adam, remember two weeks ago, I was telling you about this, my new t-shirt business I'm launching. Well, it's live and I can't thank you enough for your support, blah, blah, blah. Like, it, it means the world to me. And then I would put it on YouTube as a private listing and I'd name it adam.mpeg or whatever. And I'd send it to you in Facebook Messenger or whatever. And then you would just see this thumbnail that had your my face on it and a little play button. And the reason we did those videos is because it it was, you know, a lot of people will send these mass messages. Can you please vote for me in this? Can you please support me in this? And they're so easy to ignore. Mm -hmm. 
I wanted to make something that was impossible to ignore. Because we got this momentum going, we triggered the 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 Indiegogo uh, trending thing, the algorithm so that we were trending. All of a sudden, I'll never forget the first sale that we got on the Indiegogo platform that was not someone whose name I recognized was someone named Johannes in Berlin. And like, mm-hmm. I don't know who that is. And that was exciting because after that, they started coming in from all over the world. And the more that people started buying, the more we continued to stay on the trending page. And people then looked at our campaign as successful and trustworthy. So if there's anything that made it work, one, obviously have a good product that you're solving a, a like a, a problem that you think that no one else is solving in a way that you can. But two, just make it seem, make the success yourself. You can't just rely on it just happening. We made the first 10, 15, $20,000 of sales happen on our own. And that was the kicker to make it look successful. And I think turn other people on to think, hey, this is something I'd back to. Johannes, if you're listening, Dan owes you some extra product. <laughs> Um, one other question I have for you related to crowdfunding that we have to hit on before we wrap up today is this idea of crowdfunding as an alternative to debt or equity financing and the way that you've capitalized the business or thought about capitalizing the business in a sense has been completely focused on crowdfunding. And I assume because you've said it to me in in past conversations that you absolutely have no intention of raising any venture, um, as you scale up. So talk to me a little bit about crowdfunding as a viable way to capitalize a business and scale. Well, I told you before that one of the big problems that we had uh, at the in, in the early days as we were selling stuff so fast, we didn't have enough inventory to get us, you know, through the day. Like we just people would come to our store and be like, you know, even if we we're advertising, like, why are you advertising? There's nothing available in stock, you know? So we had a ton of that and we just needed money. So I was thinking, I, w- I remember going to a bank and, you know, you're in Canada too. The banks are super conservative. So we said, look, we need a line of credit. And they're like, you guys don't even have a, over a year of financials. Like we can maybe give you a credit card um, for $10,000. Like that's not enough. We need more money. So we're thinking, okay, um, we could find a private loan. Like I don't know who's going to lend us money or we could uh, go sell some equity in the business, which was like the last thing we wanted to do. But then it just hit us in the head, like, why don't we just do another crowdfunding campaign? It worked the first time. So when we made our first hoodie, we did it as a crowdfunding campaign, but it was solely just to get – because what crowdfunding does is it gives you the permission to sell a product so far in advance of your production date that it's just, like, solves the entire cash flow problem. Like, that's it. Cash flow is a huge problem for almost any business. It's a challenge that you have to figure out. But if you can go and sell – you know, to 2,000 customers and sell $350,000, $400,000 of product before you even have to put a deposit on producing it, that's the, it's like, it's reversing the entire challenge of cash flow. So we did it, but this time when we did it the second time, we already had a customer base who were interested in our product and loved our product. So it was way less work to do the second one. We still had to make a good product. We still had to make a good campaign, but we didn't have to rely on like getting my, you know, my cousin to go buy stuff. We didn't ask anyone because we already had a customer base at that point. So the second campaign we did was our hoodie. And I also did about $400,000 and that completely circumvented our need to have to go seek any financing and allow us to retain, you know, entire ownership and freedom that we have in our business. That's an important point. Uh, Sorry. (laughs) I said last question. I'll ask you another one. Um, you, you've said in the past that this business is about freedom. And so the idea of raising capital is kind of counterintuitive to that in terms of your core values. So just say more a little bit about that for listeners. You know, that's in the name. You know, we're Unbound Merino. You know, it, it's not only solving a problem that you can have less luggage so you could be more free to enjoy the experiences and, you know, you know not have the burden of dragging a suitcase around on your trip. You know, the brand at ethos is about freedom, but it's not, that's from the product standpoint, but that's also in how we built this business. Like we made sure that everything could be run remotely. And this is well before the pandemic. It was our intention that we will build a business that will grant us the freedom to live the lives that we want to live. And seeking capital uh, is really at odds with that because once you 
sell equity in the business. You have shareholders you're beholden to, and we're not interested in that. Like we like our lives. We like our freedom. That's who we are. And we want to remain unbound. So we decided that the better way to, to continue to grow this business is not to seek capital, not to bring in investors, but just to do it our own way and, and hopefully be able to do that forever that way. I think that's a great place to stop. Dan, thanks so much for joining me today. Dan Dembski, co-founder of Unbound Merino. That's all the time we have for this week. Join us next time for more stories from entrepreneurs. I'm Adam Levinter. Talk to you soon.